drum came into my life uh, primarily through, through a course that we offer here at Muhlenberg, uh, a swimming for fitness course. One night after class, he said, you know, I'm really, I'm really thinking about trying something different. And I've been to Hawaii a number of times, and, and I've done a, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. How would you like to become involved with a venture that takes you from London to Paris? And of course, he started to talk about it and, and what it would entail. Um, my first reaction was to sit back in the chair. And I asked him to go home that night and, and get plenty of rest and call me in the morning, because I thought that he had swum a lap too many. Uh, Needless to say, he went home, he thought it over, and uh, he called me up, or in fact got back to me the following week, and he, we talked it over, and uh, one thing led to another. Well, the physical aspects are relatively simple. We're going to start at the Tower of London, uh, bike down to Dover, which is about 78 miles, swim the channel to, uh, hopefully, to a little village called Wissant on the French coast, get back on the bicycle and bike down to Chantilly, and then uh, put on the sneakers and run to Paris and finish at the Eiffel Tower. Well, this was a, uh, an old uh, uh, four-person, uh, three-day stage race that the British and the French used to run. And I had a team entered in a few years ago, and the race was canceled. It's never been rescheduled. So I had sort of a, an interest in trying to do it. And about a year and a half ago, uh, John McVann and I were talking, and uh, he agreed to train me to try to do it as a, as a solo event. And it was kind of a lark, and we started training last year, and then I got uh, bogged down with a couple of blocked arteries and uh, got shut down for a while. So we got that straightened out. We uh, started training again, and this time it was a little more serious business, because when you're not allowed to do something, uh, you get very determined to do it. Well, uh, another sideline of this event is that Drum told me a long time ago that, that he's never been first in anything and that he wanted to go out and do something and be the first person to do it. I don't think there was ever a doubt as, as to his ability once we got involved in it. And it, and it just seems that once we started, um, what I had thought was really true, that he was a very tough person mentally. Uh, physically, he's, he's probably a step behind um, but he once said to me that, that no one passes him after the halfway point of a race. Well, we, we've, discussed, we've discussed the entire venture backwards, forwards, inside out. We, we've tried to brainstorm as much as we possibly could. Uh, we realize that we can finesse both the bike and the run, but the swim is the crucial part. And probably Drum's weakest event will be the swim. That's going to be compounded by the fact that uh, you're, you're swimming the most treacherous challenging body of water probably in the world. So most of our training percentage-wise, uh, a large, a very large slice of the pie has, has been dedicated to what we do in the pool. Oh, I don't know. It's something that uh, is sufficiently difficult that you, you, can't, you can't be certain that you can do it. It's not a, it's not a matter of <clears throat> how fast. It's a matter of whether you, can, whether you can do it, mainly getting across the channel. Um, but if I didn't think there was a good possibility, uh, probably wouldn't put everybody to all the trouble of going over there and trying it. It's an absolutely classic course, and uh, it hasn't been done, and it just sounds like something to be fun to try to do. It's showtime. The team set up headquarters at the Tower Hotel, adjacent to the Tower of London. The event was to begin Friday evening, July 27th, and continue non-stop for 48 hours. The start would depend on weather conditions in the English Channel. For two days, the team waited. Winds on the Channel rose to force three. A start was not recommended if existing or predicted winds were above force two or about 10 knots. If the race was delayed further, some members of the small support team would be unable to stay for completion. Likewise, other arrangements critical to success would also be jeopardized. 
By Sunday, weather forecasts remain pessimistic, calling for winds to increase to force four by the next day. Time was running out. Hoping for a break in the weather, the decision was made to begin the 75-mile bike ride to Dover that evening and recheck conditions on the channel at dawn. At dawn, winds on the channel were light. There was a chance the forecast had been wrong, and the channel crossing might be accomplished. The tide crested at 6.10 a.m., and the 21-mile swim began. How's the temperature? Temperature. 
Okay. Feel okay? Yep. How's that thing in the back, Velcro, is it bothering you? A little bit. Okay. How's the feet and the hands? Okay. All right, good. Drum, you're up to 52 a minute. All right, doing a good job. Just try and relax a little bit. Doing a nice job. Stroke, keep your stroke good and long. Good time, we'll get it, take your time. There you go. Okay, we're off, good job. Relax, just relax. Out easy now. Good. Good. Your breathing pattern's excellent. Rhythmic wise, you're doing real well. You're kicking ass. Hang tough. Yeah, uh, that's the pain. Yep, it is. Alright. Nice and easy now. between 46 and 50. It's great. Doing a great job. How's the fingers? Hands okay? okay. Arms all right? Yep. Okay, good. Just having a gay old time out there. By noon, winds had increased to force four as predicted. After six hours of effort, 12 miles of the crossing had been completed. Progress was becoming much slower in the rough seas. Although it was possible to labor against the current for a few more hours, the prospects for a completed crossing were becoming increasingly dim. The decision was made to stop the channel swim but continue the event on shore. Several hours were spent in Wissant, reorganizing the support crew and reloading the vans. The race continued south, 160 miles, to Chantilly.
The team had traveled the 160 miles from Wissant in 11 hours, 49 minutes, averaging approximately 13 and a half miles per hour. After a short break, the four-hour marathon to Paris was begun. The goal was in sight. Traffic in the city was dense, and it became impossible to maintain contact with the vans. A young Frenchman, a member of the support team, joined in the final miles of the run, leading the way through cars, trucks, and pedestrians on the bustling streets of midday Paris. 37 hours had elapsed since leaving the Tower of London, well within the 48-hour time limit. The race was over.